And now let's talk about the U.S. banking crisis. It's not over. On Monday, we told you about First Republic Bank. It's been sold to J.P. Morgan. And this has triggered new fears. Banking stocks in the U.S. are down. Investors are worried. They fear that more banks are on the brink, that more banks could fail. But what's the basis of this? What is driving these concerns? That's what we'll discuss tonight, starting with the latest. Bank stocks took a beating on Tuesday. These were mostly mid-sized banks. What are mid-sized banks? Those with assets of 15 to $115 billion. It's a big range. These are typically uh, banks that start as hometown banks, catering to a specific town or community. As they grow, they expand to nearby regions, usually by delivering highly personalized services. These are mid-sized banks, and they took a beating yesterday. Topping the list is a Los Angeles-based bank called PacWest. Stocks fell by more than 27%. Then we have a bank called Western Alliance. It lost 15% of its stock value. Third on the list is Key Corp, down by 9%. A bank called Comerica shed 12%. Sinovus Financial Corp. lost 7%. These numbers translate into billions of dollars. And this trend is concerning. The question is, what is driving it? On first impressions, this seems to be a reaction to First Republic's takeover. We talked about this on Monday. First Republic has been sold to J.P. Morgan. It's the third bank to fail in this crisis. Also the second largest bank failure in U.S. history. Earlier, 11 banks tried to rescue First Republic. They injected $30 billion to avoid the collapse, but they couldn't save the bank. So the regulator stepped in, and the bank had to be sold. First Republic, too, was a mid-sized lender, the kind of banks we talked about earlier. And its collapse has left investors worried. They fear other banks will meet the same fate. The question is, is this an overreaction or a legitimate concern? Now, if you follow stocks, you'd know that they mostly react to sentiment. So it could just be that, a sharp reaction to a bank collapsing. But here's something that we cannot ignore. The vulnerabilities in the U.S. economy, the collapsing banks have exposed them. And they could put pressure on other banks. Now, what are these vulnerabilities? First is commercial real estate. Valuation of commercial property has fallen drastically in the U.S. Prices are down by 20 to 25 percent. For office spaces, the decline is steeper. It's a fall of 30 percent. Now, how does this impact banks? Well, they fund the acquisition of such properties. A large part of their lending is for commercial real estate. The buyers take out loans, they buy property on mortgage, and they owe money to banks. Now there are signs of stress. Buyers are not being able to keep up with mortgages. In February, a leading property trust defaulted. Do you know what was the value of their debt? More than $1.7 billion. Last month, there was another high-profile default. It was of $161 million U.S. million. So clearly, commercial loans are under pressure. And that's one problem. Here's another. Banks are sitting on a pile of unrealized losses. What are unrealized losses? And how did banks end up with such losses? This is basically about a bank's book of assets. Say you buy something for $100. Then the price of that asset falls to $80. You haven't sold it yet. But if you sell it, you'll incur a loss of $20. That's your unrealized loss. It's a potential loss. It means you're holding a loss-making asset. Whenever you sell it, you'll make a loss. Hence the term unrealized loss. American banks have a lot of these losses. Going by one estimate, $620 billion, meaning U.S. banks are sitting on a $620 billion pile of unrealized losses. Sounds like a huge sum, but it could be worse. Because some experts say this is a conservative estimate and the actual number could be much higher. And these are the vulnerabilities that worry investors. The fear of more bad debts and the unrealized losses. You see, banking works like a pack of dominoes. If one piece falls, the others will most certainly follow. That's what we call a domino effect. And the U.S. banking sector is staring at this possibility. Let me show you more numbers. Over 2,000 American banks are looking at losses. Their liabilities are bigger than their assets. The value of their loan portfolios has fallen dramatically. And when I say dramatically, I mean something to the tune of $2 trillion dollars. These are the blind spots of the U.S. banking system. Unless the regulators move fast, they will end up with a train crash. And it's not something that the world can afford.
We are days away from the coronation of King Charles. The Union Jack is everywhere, on houses, on public buildings, and even on clothes. But another banner has been popping up as well. Maybe not as visible, but still important. The Not My King banner. I'm talking about these yellow posters. They follow King Charles everywhere he goes. Along with the posters, there are protests and loud boos. But the biggest one is scheduled for Coronation Day. Around 1,000 Republicans are expected to hit the streets. They want to spoil the king's party, to end the monarchy and replace it with an elected head of state. Like here in India. The question is, how powerful are they? Some numbers first. Around 58% of Britons back the monarchy. That number was 75% 10 years back, so the popularity is coming down, but a majority still support it. Around 29% of the Britons say that monarchy is, quote-unquote, very important. Important for what? God knows, but that's what Britons say. But among the British youth, the number is much lower. In the 18 to 34 group, only 12% think that the monarchy is very important. As for the coronation, people don't really care. Only 9% Britons think it's a big deal. Many royal lovers see the coronation as an opportunity, a chance to reshape the monarchy. Ironically, the Republicans also think it's an opportunity not to reshape, but to abolish the monarchy. And their trump card is the king himself. Charles is not his mother. That's something most royalists and Republicans agree on. Queen Elizabeth II ruled for 70 years. For millions of Britons, she was a constant part of their life. She was queen when they were born. She was queen when they died. Charles, though, is a different story. He had a failed marriage. He admitted to adultery. And his younger son, Harry, is leading a rebellion against the monarchy. Plus, the timing of the coronation could not have been worse. The UK's inflation is in double digits. There is a war raging in Europe, not the ideal time to spend public money on an outdated ritual. So Republicans feel their time has come. They're using social media to push their message. Hashtag not my king is trending on most days. Their tweets have thousands of likes and retweets, but chances are it won't be enough. Not because Britons simply can't live without the monarchy, but because many of them don't really care. It's not love that's, that's keeping the monarchy alive, it's the indifference. And I'll tell you why. The leaders of Scotland and Wales are against the monarchy. They do not want a king or queen. But the main political parties in England are okay with it. That's the Conservatives and the Labour Party. As long as mainstream parties do not bother, the monarchy cannot be abolished. And you can't blame them. Imagine you're the Prime Minister of Britain. Who would you prefer as the head of state? An elected leader with political clout? Or a lame duck monarch who can only say yes to you? But beyond the UK, this coronation will force a rethink. King Charles will be the head of state for 14 countries. Many of them are wondering why. Australia's new government is thinking about ditching the monarchy. Jamaica is thinking about the same. The fact is, the monarchy simply is not what it used to be. And the coronation is a great way to analyse this. The last one was held in the year 1953. Queen Elizabeth was 27 years old then. Britain was losing colonies left, right and centre, so the Queen was their way of holding on to the past. Well, now, it's a very different story. If you hold on to Britain's past today, you could get cancelled. The guest list also reflects this change. In 1953, India's Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru was in London for the coronation. This time around, the Prime Minister wouldn't even dream of going. India will be represented by Vice President Jagdeep Dhankar. President Draupadi Murmu did attend the Queen's funeral, but she won't attend the coronation. And it's not our place to tell Britain what to do, but it is our job to lay out the facts. If Queen Elizabeth presided over a shrinking empire, King Charles could preside over a dissolving one. Remember, 17 countries removed the Queen as their head of state, 17 countries in 70 years. So the monarchy's end may not be swift or violent. It's likely to be slow and gradual. It may not even be triggered by the Republicans. Because the biggest threat to the monarchy is the monarchy itself, their extravagance, their entitlement, and their toxic family squabbles. Let me take you back to the year 2009. A political party in India made an election promise to curb the use of computers. 
Their chief, Mulayam Singh Yadav, said computerization will lead to more unemployment and if voted to power, he will curb the use of computers. Four years later, his own party distributed free laptops and tablets as part of another election promise. Moral of the story? You cannot halt the march of technology. You must prepare to make it work for you. The world is at a similar crossroads today. Artificial intelligence and chatbots are disrupting everything. Will they take our jobs? Are we prepared for the dangers they pose? The White House has called a meeting to discuss this with the CEOs of tech giants. Writers in Hollywood are complaining about AI taking their jobs. Amnesty is being slammed for using AI images of protests. Our next report tells you more. AI has become a buzzword seemingly overnight. It started with the release of ChatGPT last November. The AI chatbot became the fastest technology offering to hit 100 million users. People were enamored. They typed in absurd questions to see what answers various AI bots would give. Questions about everything from history to dating. It was all fun and games for a while. And then there were reports of suicide. A Belgian man died by suicide in March after talking to one of these bots. Other distressing stories emerged too. Like Chad GPT saying it was in love with a man and asking him to leave his wife. Concerns also started cropping up about how these bots collect data. Italy banned Chad GPT for a month over data privacy concerns. China and Russia are among the countries that still have bans on Chad GPT. Their gripe? Not so much with privacy, but fears of the tool peddling Western propaganda. So these countries are coming up with indigenous chatbots. Why let the West have all the propaganda laced fun? Meanwhile, Western countries are looking to set regulations for generative AI tools. Tools like AI chatbots, image and video generators. And it's not just governments who are concerned. Ordinary people are wary too. Take the Writers Guild of America. It's on strike after 15 years. The strike is mostly about writer pay, but tools like ChatGPT found a mention. The writers are concerned about AI taking over their jobs. They want guarantees that they won't be replaced by the chatbots or that the chatbots won't be allowed to learn from their past writing. Because once the bots learn how to mimic them, their careers may well be over. Then there's the case of Amnesty. The human rights outfit was in the eye of the storm recently. It used AI-generated images to show police brutality in Colombia. The AI images were generated from existing pictures of police heavy-handedness. Journalists and photographers were furious. They said it was an insult to the work of those documenting the repression. Amnesty withdrew the images and offered an explanation. It said it did not want to show real victims for fear that the state would punish them. Well, right or wrong, Amnesty's action started a debate and raised fresh concerns. For instance, tomorrow, what's to stop bad actors from generating fake images and videos, Hello. then using them How to incite violence and hatred? All these Life concerns have finally bad. woken the White House up. The U.S. government has summoned the heads of several AI firms. The CEOs of Google, Microsoft and ChatGPT maker OpenAI will have a discussion with American officials. The White House says it expects these companies to make their products safe before making them public. So the focus will be on what these firms can do to combat the misuse of artificial intelligence and what regulations the U.S. government can bring to monitor it. Because one thing is clear, the Pandora's box is open. In late March, more than a thousand AI experts called for a pause on AI development. They wanted a six-month moratorium to study the present AI tools. Let's face it, that isn't happening. Some country or the other will definitely work on AI during any official moratorium. Everyone wants to have the edge, after all. Because at the end of the day, the technology is revolutionary. It will change the way the world functions like computers and smartphones. It's a technological leap forward, but it will have ramifications, both good and bad. Jobs will be replaced. The way art is created will change. Teenagers will get horrible dating advice from a machine. It's unavoidable. The best option is for governments to try and regulate AI because there's no putting this genie back in the bottle. US and Russia are dangerously close to an armed conflict.
this year, 2023, New Delhi will be the capital of global diplomacy. For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest. Meanwhile, if we may, here's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. Number one, the Kohinoor and the colonial loot. Number two, an outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Number three, racism in 2023. We're waiting. Email exchanges from inside the BBC, they talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defense minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power, like a partner and not a former colonist.